Good morning. Welcome to Shepherd of the Plains Lutheran Church on this third Sunday in Lent. We are having a lot of technical difficulties today, so I apologize for us not having bulletins as we normally do. That means we get to do things old school with the liturgy. Uh, you'll find that on page 173 in the front part of the hymnal. As we gather for worship this morning, it's one of the things we get to actually look at is why do we worship? What does it mean to worship? And as you'll be reminded today, worship does not mean we need bulletins. It doesn't mean that we need to be absolutely perfect with all of the bells and whistles that go into it. Worship means we get to gather around God's word and we get to receive things from God. We get to receive his grace day after day. So I pray that that's what you're reminded of as we gather today. We'll begin with hymn 407 on my heart. Sorry, 407. are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy we have done those things that we should not have done, and we have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us, forgive us, and restore us according to your promises in Christ Jesus. God, our merciful Father, has forgiven our sins. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer and Savior. Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by his death on the cross and freed us from death by his resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God now and forever. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Lord, be with you. Let us pray. Grant us, Lord, the spirit to think and do what is right, that we who cannot do anything that is good without you may by your help be enabled to live according to your will. 
through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. our God in worship and confession. Now we get to hear what he says to us in his word. Our first reading this morning is taken from Exodus chapter 20, and the first part of this reading will be the basis of the sermon. And God spoke these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll join now in speaking Psalm 19, we'll speak the psalm responsively. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the word of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. And the heavens God has it is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. Like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect. Refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy. Making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right. Giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Our second reading this morning is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. As Paul opens the letter to the Corinthians, he tells them something interesting. We preach something very foolish. We preach about a guy dying. That seems so out of place, and yet that is what gives us forgiveness. It's what gives us strength. Paul wrote, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent. I will frustrate Where's the wise person? Where's the teacher of the law? Where's the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, 
The world, through its wisdom, did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand out of respect for the words and works of our Savior. The gospel appointed for the third Sunday in Lent is taken from John chapter 2. Jesus drives out the money changers in the temple. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins and the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. Our Savior says, let the little children come to me. So at this time, I invite our youngest members forward for the children's message. Good morning. How are y'all doing today? Uh, I'll open that later, okay? Afterward, I can open that for you. <laughs> All right, I got a question for y'all. What have I got here? What is it? What'd you say it is, Jake? Yeah, it's a mirror. What do you do with mirrors? Yeah, Carter, if you look at this mirror, what do you see? You, yeah, you see the mirror, but what do you see in the mirror? Do you see yourself? Jake, do you see yourself? Yeah, you use a mirror to look at yourself, to see what you look like. Today, in God's word, he shows us what he looks like. He doesn't use a mirror. He describes himself. And when God describes himself, he shows us how much he loves us. Because he tells us that he comes down from heaven to love us, to show us his mercy, to forgive all our sins. That's who our God is. We don't get to see him in a mirror, but we get to see him in his word. We get to see him at the cross where Jesus dies for us to win us forgiveness. We get to see him at the empty tomb where we're shown that Jesus' work was all for us. And that now we get to go to heaven because of our Savior. So why don't we join in prayer, thanking our God for showing us who he is. Lord, we would come to you with so many wrong ideas about who you are. And yet, in your word, you show us who you are. You are a gracious God who loves us dearly, who has done everything to forgive us all our sins. Thank you for this. May we go in peace knowing this all the days of our life. Amen. Okay, y'all can go back to your seats. We'll continue with him. 558, salvation unto us has come.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance. Through God our Father and through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in 1980, Robert Ludlum introduced the world to a character named David Webb. In the best-selling novel, where David Webb is the main character, he goes on quite an adventure of trying to figure out who he is. In the midst of that, he ends up protecting people he cares about, and he's even trying to clear his name of some crimes. It's a really, really great spy novel, if you're into that sort of thing. And then Robert Ludlum followed it up with two sequels. After his death, a guy named Eric Van Lustbader took over, wrote 11 more sequels. It's a really big series now. And you're probably wondering to yourself, because I see some of you kind of looking at me like I'm crazy, what was that book from 1980, and who is David Webb? I'm not going to tell you, at least not right now. Because the entire point of the book is David trying to find out who he is. And now today, as we've focused on worshiping God in our songs and in the lessons we read, we have a similar question of identity. We're trying to answer the question, who is God? Now, the book of Exodus, where our first lesson was taken from, it's kind of the theme of the whole book. God's constantly giving us glimpses of who he is. We see it in the ten plagues. We see how powerful he is. He brings Israel out of Egypt, leads them in a pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. He cares for Israel. Gives them manna, bread, straight from heaven so that they can eat. Then, when they're not happy enough with that, he drives quail into the camp so they even get some meat. When they're thirsty, he gives them water from a rock. And then, they get to Mount Sinai. And that's where they really get to see a glimpse of who God is. Exodus 19, right before what we read this morning, we hear this. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. I can't blame the Israelites for being afraid. They had seen bits of God's glory here and there. But this is different. And the reason God shows up on Sinai is to address them personally. Of course they're trembling in fear. This is the most openly they have seen the glory of God thus far. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. God answers our question right there. Who is God? He's the Lord, the one who brought the people of Israel out of this horrible slavery in Egypt. He didn't do it because they were really special. He did it because he had made a covenant with their forefather, Abraham. But even Abraham wasn't an incredible guy. If we look back at when God called Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, We don't find mention of Abraham did some really good things to make himself look good in God's sight. We don't hear Abraham was so successful that God wanted him on his team. 
Instead, we just find God showing up to this nomad and telling him he's going to bless him in all these incredible ways. And it's purely out of God's love. And that's the same love that he used when he rescued the Israelites. Moses is well known, but he is not a leader that pulled himself up by his bootstraps. Israel became well known. They were not the greatest nation on earth. And yet God rescued them purely out of his love for them, not because of their works. That's who God is. And having reminded them of his love and power in this display, he tells them they shouldn't worship any other gods. Don't make any images of them. Don't serve them. But considering everything God had done up to this point, how he had chosen their ancestor Abraham purely out of love and grace, how he had then fulfilled his side of the covenant, blessed Abraham abundantly, and then remembered that covenant hundreds of years later to bring Abraham's descendants out of Egypt. Why on earth would they ever want to worship another god? Well, why do you or I ever want to worship another god? I'm not covering all of the Ten Commandments this morning, but when we look at them, really, all of them stem from the first one. You shall have no other gods before me. God, who we have already clearly seen, loves and cares for his creation, wants to protect his creation. And when we try to get away from that protection, well... Really, we're just trying to make a God in the image we want. When worship here just becomes another job for me, instead of a place where I get to receive God's love, work has become an idol. When my anger flares up at the drivers around here who just can't seem to wrap their heads around street laws. And my first thought is, you know, I hope you get what's coming to you, even if that means you end up in an accident. Am I really caring about God's gift of life that he protects in the commandments? When I talk to fellow pastors, and they tell me some of the good stuff going on at their church, and I wish... I served a congregation like that one. Am I praising God for the gifts Shepherd of the Plain has? Or am I showing that I am horribly, horribly discontent? It all really just comes down to if only God would be the way I want him to be. Now, admittedly, I have not listed out all of the commandments, and I don't know which ones in Exodus 20 you struggle with the most, what idols you keep going back to. But I know why we do it. It's because you and I and every other person, we have been born into this darkness of sin. Because Satan sowed seeds of discontent in the Garden of Eden, he convinced Adam and Eve that they could be like God. And so they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Instead of worshiping God who wanted to protect them, they were tempted into worshiping themselves. And when you get down to it, that's every sin. Instead of worshiping God, we turn and we worship ourselves. And God warns us about that very clearly. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third 
and fourth generation of those who hate me. He doesn't mince words. We deserve an eternal punishment in hell because of our constant attempts at making new gods. But the thing is, I don't want you leaving here having heard that, thinking you have to do something to make it up to God. If I were to stop the sermon at Exodus 20, verse 5, I'm scared you'd walk out the door saying, I have to love God really hard so he won't punish me. That doesn't answer our question. Remember our question, who is God? That's not the answer. Let's look again at where God started all this. As he spoke to the Israelites, he said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He tells them he is the God who keeps his word. That's what Lord in all caps is, God's covenant name, the one that says, I keep all the promises I make. He's the one who brought them out of captivity all because he is merciful. And that's really what God ends up focusing on. Yes, we heard God is jealous. He will not give his honor to any false god as well he shouldn't. But we also heard this, that he shows mercy to a thousand generations of those who love him keep his commandments. And yes, I know if you were to look at the NIV, Exodus 20, verse 6, it says showing love. Mercy is a much better idea of what's going on there. Because God cares so much about his creation that he stoops down to you. In all of this greatness, the thunder and lightning and the cloud and the trumpet that these Israelites see. God comes down and he sees the issues of sinful humanity and he addresses them. That's who God is. He looks on each and every one of you with love and he meets your deepest need. And notice how much greater his mercy and kindness are in this section. Yeah, God says he punishes sin to the third and fourth generation. He shows mercy to a thousand generations. So his mercy goes to you, dear Christian, all because he loves you. And God knows you. He knows that each and every one of us, we struggle with sin. And so God gives us the solution. Because God, the Son, left his throne in heaven. He came down. Remember the mercy word. He came down to live here on earth. And when you read through Exodus 20 and the Ten Commandments, Maybe all you can see is every moment you failed. That's certainly all I can see. I see every time where I have come up short, where I have worshipped a false god. But then when we look at Jesus' life, what do we see? We see him glorifying God in everything. So that where our sinful nature will pull us toward our own desires... Christ kept every one of God's commands perfectly. He was always content, always loving, always putting God first. But he didn't just glorify God in life, he glorified him in death. Because that's where we see God's mercy on the clearest display. That the Son of God would take the sins of the world on himself and suffer the punishments of hell to give his mercy to all people. At the cross, your sins, they're forgiven. That is who God is. 
He's the one who saw your need and he took care of it by sending his perfect son to save you. Do you realize just how incredible that is? God loves you so much, he gave up everything for you. But his love doesn't just involve the life we live here on earth and the sins we deal with now. His love goes further because God defeated death for you. Jesus didn't just die and stay dead. He rose again as a sign to you that his work in your place that was acceptable to God and now heaven's yours because you're God's child. What do children do? They love their father because of who he is. God, our father, he's the one who keeps being kind to us even when we certainly don't deserve it. It's part of what makes it kindness and mercy. And that's why we worship him. That's why we keep the commandments. We do not keep them because they get us forgiveness. We keep the commandments because God still loves us even when we are at our most unlovable. That's just who God is. And since I've answered that question, I guess I should probably answer the question I started with. Who's David Webb? from that 1980 book written by Robert Ludlum. The entire book, David's trying to figure out who he is. But you probably don't know him as David Webb because Robert Ludlum didn't write a book called The Webb Identity. The book in 1980 is The Bourne Identity where you follow Jason Bourne as he realizes that's an alias. Jason Bourne, David Webb, his identity is a mystery. That's part of what makes the book so intriguing. God's not a mystery. He tells you exactly who he is. He's the one who sees every one of your needs and he takes care of them because he's the one who has saved you, forgiven every one of your sins. That's God. To God alone be the glory. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God, which is greater than all of our human understanding, may it guard our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll join now in confessing our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed found on the screen in front of you or if you're using the hymnal on page 180. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, <coughs> eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism, of sins, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. You may be seated for the prayer of the church. <coughs> Eternal Lord, 
give us peace as we ponder the good news that you forgive our sins in Christ. Lead us to see clearly the path you have laid out for us. Work in us so that we believe and live in the word we have heard today. Provide courage and compassion to all who preach and teach your word. Fill them with a love like yours as they proclaim your grace to us and all people. Guard and guide the families of our congregation. Lead husbands and wives to love each other with commitment, respect, and patience. Help parents to grasp the eternal value of keeping their children close to Jesus all their lives. Grant joy to those who are single and make them a blessing to others. Provide wisdom and insight to those who make laws and set policies. Give us respect for those who protect us from crime. Lead us to value the rights of our fellow citizens and to defend those who cannot defend themselves. Give us passion to share the story of your love with our family and friends. Overcome unbelief and open the hearts of people everywhere to believe the good news that Jesus has forgiven their sins and opened the gates of heaven. Extend your healing power to those who are sick and suffering in body or mind. We especially think about Linda Wilson as she recovers from hip surgery and David Patton as he deals with various health issues. Give patience and compassion to all who care for the sick and dying. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. Heavenly Father, comfort the family of Ladora Bremer and Oliver Larson, whom you have now called home to eternal glory in heaven. We praise you for making them your children in baptism and sustaining their faith through the good news about Jesus our Savior. We thank you for the blessings you brought to your church, this community, and their family through their lives of Christian service. May the peace and promise of your son's atoning sacrifice on the cross and his empty tomb bring assurance to the, hel- to the hearts of of all who mourn. Help us always to live in joyful anticipation of the day when you will call us from our graves. Reunite us with both Oliver and Ladora and all believers and fill us with perfect bliss in your presence forever. And we praise you, Lord, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Receive our thanks that you have brought Jessica Picon and her new son, Amari, safely through the delivery process. In your goodness, you have filled the hearts of this family with joy. Bless this child by caring for all his needs and watching over him with your protecting hand. As you gave your son to purchase this child for yourself, so also send your spirit through baptism that he may become a member of your family of faith. May his parents and this congregation lead him to your saving love all his days, that you may preserve him with life that never ends. Gracious God, you govern and direct all things, and you love all people. Hear our prayers, spoken and silent and answer them in your wisdom and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We continue by gathering our gifts for the work of the church.
Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who brought the gift of salvation to all people by his death on the tree of the cross, so that the devil, who overcame us by a tree, would in turn by a tree be overcome. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. to receive thanks and praise from all people. You created the world and all who live in it, and in your mercy, you saved us. We give thanks to you for the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ. Though in very nature God, he took the nature of a servant and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. He offered himself as a sacrifice for sin and redeemed us from its curse and penalty. He rescued us from the terrors of death and restored eternal life with you. He conquered our enemies and gained for us the kingdom of grace and glory. Bless us as we receive your son's body and blood and lead us to remember his suffering, death, and resurrection. Forgive our sins and fill us with the hope of new life in heaven. Hear our praise and receive our thanks as we worship you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we join in the prayer our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
You may be seated. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given into death for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given into death for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given into death for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This is the true blood of your Savior, shed for you for the remission of all of your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of your Savior, shed for you for the remission of all of your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of your Savior, shed for you for the remission of all of your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of your Savior, shed for you for the remission of all of your sins. Christ's true body and blood has strengthened you, and it will preserve you in your faith until life everlasting. You may depart in peace because your sins are forgiven. Please stand. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we be providing the Lord's death until he comes. We give you thanks, O Lord, for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet you have given us in this sacrament. Through this gift, you have fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your Spirit, help us to live as your holy people until that day when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. 
the Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated as we close with hymn 407, When I Survey the Wondrous Christ. are not on the screen like normal, but I do have them here. Um, first of all, WOW is meeting right after worship, so that's the women's group. Um, if you are interested, they meet in the fellowship hall right after. Um, everyone is invited to that, um, or I should say all the ladies are invited to that. Uh, leaders, just a reminder, we do have a leadership meeting tomorrow at 7 p.m. Um, this should be the last one on a Monday, as Lent is going to be over in a few weeks, and then we'll go back to our normal Wednesday nights in April. Um, we do have a Lenten meal this week at 6 p.m., service to follow at 7. Um, the theme for the meal is Mexican dishes, so uh, if you are bringing anything to that, that's the theme we're trying. And then finally, um, I should say finally in the bulletin, Easter for Kids, again, is March 23rd. Um, so I, in the bulletin email, you can pull it up. Um, I have the link there. You can click it if you or any of your friends um, want to sign up. This is for kids ages 3 through 8. Um, and the link is live, but it has not been published on Facebook or anything like that yet. So if you want to sign up, do it now. Um, Christmas for kids, we put it on Facebook, and it filled up a lot faster than we realized. So. You've got a little bit of a head start. Please, if you're going to fill this out, do it now. Um, we want to make sure that we're serving our families as well as the community. Um, and then one that didn't make it in, but I did just want to point out. Uh, so yesterday, Jasmine and I were in Amarillo. They had a nice outreach evangelism event um, for 
just kind of the Texas panhandle. Um, mostly it was folks at Amazing Grace that made it and then Jazz and I made the drive up. Um, but I talked with the presenter, um, Pastor Gunnar Lederman. Uh, he's gonna give me his PowerPoint. I wanna run the same thing uh, on March 16th. I know that's two weeks, um, but it's the week right before East, Easter for kids. That's on purpose. We are going to have visitors here. That means we should consider how we love them and how we care for them and how we have conversations with them. Um, it's, it's not a long thing. This will literally be like an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes of this, and then we can go and eat together and have fun. Um, it's so worthwhile. It was such a good get together. Um, and it's just a great reminder of how we get to love people. So um, I will give you more info in the Shepherd's Kirk this week, but just put that on your calendars. March 16th, we're doing it here. Um, and something to think about for next year, um, we've been asked to host next year. We're doing the outreach evangelism thing, which is great. The hope is because it's more central, not only will more of us come, but that way folks from Amarillo will come down, folks from Midland will come up. Lord willing, we'll fill this uh, area with people who can, pres who can learn more about just loving their community, sharing Jesus with folks. It's gonna be great. Um, we might even know the presenter if we know him. It, if it's who we talked about, he's awesome. I don't wanna, don't wanna put too much out there in case we don't get Tom, but Tom is great. Um, anyway, with all of that being said, um, I am so thankful that we get to worship our God, not because we do anything to be pleasing to him, but because he has constantly loved us and he keeps loving us. And I pray that's what you get reminded of today and always. I'll greet you at the door. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, yes. So visit information for Linda. As far as I know, um, the last I heard, she was in the process of getting moved to Trust Point. I actually have to touch base with her and just see if she's still there or if she has been moved there or not. Um, yeah, so for those who don't know, and it, it got mentioned very briefly in the prayer of the church, Linda Wilson um, fell last week um, in her home, was able to get to the phone, but um, Linda is in her 80s, so... Um, they had to go in and replace her hip. Thankfully, she didn't break anything, which is incredible. Um, so I got to visit her a couple times over at Covenant, and then she had told me she was basically, she knew she would go to Trust Point for some rehab. Um, I will make that public as soon as I know all the details, but um, as far as I know, she is on her way out of the hospital into the rehab center so she can start working on her leg. Um, so please keep her in your thoughts and prayers as, uh, as she goes through this. She's in great spirits. Um, she's just so happy. She's, you know, as, as up and about as she can be while being in bed after a surgery. But she's, she's in great spirits. She's happy that y'all are thinking about her, and she's more than, I, I think she's more than willing to accept visitors once, uh, once I get that info to you. So I think that's it. Now I will greet you at the door.